Alright, hi everyone. My name is Steven Stone. I'm a staff member for Geek Girl Con. Um, today, we are going to be talking about burlesque and its resurgence in the modern era and its now evolution into what is known as nerdlesque or geeklesque or geeks taking off clothes, nerds taking off clothes, anything along those lines. Um, I have four experienced performers and producers with me today. We're going to talk about all of these things, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves to my right. Hi, I'm uh, Jojo Stiletto. I'm a local burlesque producer and performer. Um, uh, my current tagline is the professor of nerdlesque. Um, I've written and spoken on the subject of nerdlesque for the last year or so, and my upcoming production is called Weedness Burlesque, burlesque inspired by the works of Joss Whedon. Or as I call it, Weedness 2. Weedness 2. The Whedoning. The Whedoning, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I am Sophie Maltese. Um, I'm a performer down in Portland, Oregon, and I'm a co-founder and co-producer at Critical Hit Burlesque, and we put on um, the Geek Burlesque series down there. Um, I'm Madeline Ryder. Uh, I uh, started as an intern for Indigo Blue uh, and worked as a production assistant for Lily Verlaine. Um, ev eventually, my co-producer and I, Wiggy Stardust, um, decided that we didn't want to work for other people anymore and wanted to produce our own show, so we formed Faux Dust, which is uh, producing Stark Naked, a nerd -less tribute to a Game of Thrones, um, which opens next week, um, July 13th and 14th. I'm Miscellaneous. I'm a Seattle burlesque performer. Um, I did Weedonesque 1, uh, Electric Boogaloo. No, uh, Electric <laughs> I don't know. The free weed me. <laughs> uh, and I'm doing Joystick, July 20th and 21st. Um, yeah. and you're a big old nerd. Yeah. And I'm a big old nerd um, in lots of different directions. One of my very first burlesque acts was to Rubber Ducky from Sesame Street, so. Yeah, so we'll give a little background for people on the nerd side of things, so maybe kind of the nerd acts we've done. I know I've done an act with Miss Lane, yes, where she was Poison Ivy, and her burlesque sister, Miss Terry, yes, was a Harley Quinn, and I came on at the end of my stage to do as Batman for a brief two seconds. <laughs> um, maybe just some other nerdy acts that you guys have done in the past, just so our crowd has an understanding of, of you guys. Well, I'm not much of a performer these days, but when I first started, um, my second act ever was a tribute to math and I had a giant calculator and I really wanted to take the idea of sort of like sexualizing math um, instead of sort of sexualizing the like the mathematician but math itself uh, and I used the music of Kraftwerk and even like six years later it's the one act that people seem to remember the most about me which is really interesting so. Uh, did your calculator have a name? Um, I named it the other day. Uh, <laughs> what was it? Uh, Sir sums a lot. Sir sums a lot. <laughs> nice. I believe I had an argument with you about it where I wanted to name it like uh, Bob. No, Halo it's Sir eight. sums a lot. Oh. Yeah, Speaking of objects that are named, <laughs> yes. you have a D20, a giant velvet D20 named have, Gary. Yes, right? I have a huge D20, yes, covered in velvet, who lives in my burly room. I was named Gary after the creator of D&D. Thank you, yes. <laughs> That's it. Everyone's either confused, half the people I tell are very confused or half of them are like, oh my god. <laughs> Well, I think that's a like that's a great um, sort of nerdlesque act. It's the first mm -hmm. one that I was drawn to because I saw a video of it, um, and it's a Dungeons and Dragons uh, themed burlesque act that um, sort of talks about putting a woman in her place, but also the fact that women do actually play Dungeons yes. and Dragons, and, and then don't you always want to be yeah. the the sexy sorceress or right in the chainmail bikini. Yeah. Exactly. Miss Lane, Miss Madeline, I don't know if you've have you, you are clear, clear, clearly obsessed with Game of Thrones. Is there anything else that you... Well, um, I'm also a contributing writer for uh, uh, Burlesque Seattle Press, um, and I reviewed Wadenesque last year, and I've always been, like, a nerd to the core since I was a little kid, and I uh, haven't been able to shake that, don't want to shake that, um, and having the opportunity to review that last year kind of, like, opened up you know, we're going to talk about it later, um, opened me up to the possibilities of the future of burlesque and where do, you know, like in Seattle, which is a super saturated city, where do, where is my niche? Right. Where do I fit in? Um, where are my people at? You know, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and just, you know, like um, expanding on what already exists, so. 
And I, I, I believe I've seen you do a Lady Macbeth act. If you want to get into a whole level of nerdetry outside of the typical fields, it's true. Uh, my level of nerddom is theater and Shakespeare and any sort of ridiculous literature. So Game of Thrones is right up there with it. Um, yeah, I did an entire show with a group of people that was the Burlesque Macbeth and we took uh, the Shakespeare play and made it naked and ridiculous, which was a lot of fun. Quite entertaining, especially watching this uh, local performer. I remember we're fabulous uh, as he's, he's dying as Lady Macduff. And he just starts yelling, why did you do that? Like, <laughs> just, it was really beautiful. All right, so basically talking about burlesque, maybe can you guys give us just kind of a background in the history of burlesque and what it is and how it came about originally. Well, I think most people uh, in the sort of modern burlesque scene start with describing um, American burlesque and its sort of discovery in the United States, which happened, I believe, in like 1868 when uh, Lydia Thompson and her British blondes came over from Europe and sort of took New York by storm with these amazing shows that were satire, they were pulling from like operas and plays and sort of the pop culture of their day and presenting it on stage with sort of like um, uh, salacious sexuality for the time, which was, you know, hemlines above the knee. I mean, there was also women doing these productions. So that sort of is the foundation of modern burlesque in the United States was late 1800s New York women uh, writing their own scripts, performing political commentary um, with humor, with sexuality. I think Seattle in particular has a really interesting history being a vice city uh, during, uh, you know, uh, you know, the early 1900s and the World's Fair and stuff like that, they actually down here in Pioneer Square, they had all these little burlesque boxes, you know, these little, ha and actually if you do like the Seattle Vice underground tour type thing, they, they bring you to these places where this early form, very, uh, you know, it is definitely not the form that it takes today and it's not the form that it took later in the 40s and 50s, um, but it, uh, Seattle has a really unique history that way. That's interesting, I yeah. don't know much about so how, how did the burlesque boxes work? Was it just kind of that typical maybe? The, the peep show box. The, the show not show. not so much. Like the, I believe that the boxes were. Um, they had vaudeville performers. They had strippers. They had like there's a very much a uh, tie to different variety performances, and so it was for you know loggers, fishermen, all the people here working out of the port um, to entertain themselves. And I mean Pioneer Square, Yesler right down here, Jackson right down here, um, is notorious for these ha for these boxes. Nice. So was it you put your quarter in or whatever, and then you saw either a vaudevillian or a stripper? I think like the mystery soda machine I think for it's, Yeah, <laughs> essentially. I think they're called boxes just because of the way that the stage was set up. But um, actually, the triple door where a lot of, um, like, where the big productions here right. in Seattle take place used to be one of those theaters. Nice. It, that was its original incarnation, so. Well, I think it's, uh, to talk about the history of burlesque, you talk about, you know, it's the idea of women writing, writing their own scripts and getting on stage. And sexuality was always a part of it, but it wasn't until a, later, a little bit later, mm -hmm. so maybe maybe it was like the 20s and 30s where sort of revealing the female form became a part of the art form mm -hmm. um, and then you know the idea that it sort of gets cracked down on in like the late 30s and the 40s you know like Mae West gets arrested for uh, doing a stage show in New York called Sex that's what it was called <laughs> um, and then sort of you know the morals of the United States starts to change after World War II and sort of even so the idea of these uh, the satire, the political commentary, um, telling stories, sort of mining from pop or mainstream culture, mm -hmm. gets sort of pushed aside for what happens in the 50s and 60s, which starts to evolve more into it's just the tease, just the yeah. tease, and just the female form. Um, and we all know, because we're historians to a certain extent as performers, that there's always going to be performers that are outside of the norm. Mm -hmm. But you know, eventually, what we end up with is stripping. Yeah. Like 70s is like hardcore um, nudity. Mm -hmm. so. Well, it's interesting too, like um, the word burlesque comes from burra, which is the Latin word for joke. And so there is always this tongue-in-cheek, you know, uh, aspect to the performances. And maybe that's, I mean, we're going to talk about the resurgence, you mm -hmm. know, eventually. And there was a resurgence because it died. Yes. You know, it became incredibly oversaturated uh, in the 60s. and um, And 
potential, you know, perhaps there was a, a, a loss of the burra, of the joke behind it, you know, who knows, but um, that's originally that vaudevillian, the very theatrical aspects, you know, very, you know, poking fun at the politicians or the people in power and... Um, well, I think you touched upon it nicely as saying that it, you know, jumped forward to like the 1990s where really you have you have strip clubs and that's it and then you have sort of like these punk riot girls of like the early 1990s who are looking at these old pictures um, from the 40s from the 50s and they're seeing this aesthetic and they're looking farther back and they're seeing that there is humor there is a way to express mm -hmm. yourself so they um, decided to sort of go back to what it once was. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard it put too that even the most glamorous numbers in neo burlesque, the most like classic glamorous numbers are completely absurd because they're so glamorous. There are so many rhinestones on that corset or those fans are so big, you know, that there is this like, just like I said, absurdity to even the classic burlesque, which may not have like an obvious plot line or a joke or something that's very clear to the audience, but. Mm -hmm. but I think uh, I've seen an act where a toilet was entirely rhinestone. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> the porcelain promenade. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're also, as performers, we understand the meaning of what classic burlesque is. Mm -hmm. In a modern era, classic burlesque tends to be a performer who is huh? a performer who is sort of hearkening back to the olden age mm -hmm. of burlesque and using that as inspiration. And we're also seeing a lot of performers who are creating something completely new. Um, which is still hearkening back to sort of the original principles of burlesque, mm -hmm. which is comedy, which is satire, which is making political commentary in some sort of way, mm -hmm. so. Okay, so basically we talked about, we had this, you know, counter to vaudeville, you know, kind of turning into this tease, and then it's come back um, in a big way in the last 10 to 15 years. And, you know, you hear a lot about how it actually ties back into feminism. So how did, how did this resurgence of burlesque happen? How does this tie tie back into you know feminism and, and, and empowerment and things like that. Well, um, I think that uh, especially in the 90s when neo burlesque was, I don't know if necessarily. You want to define neo burlesque? Okay, for... neo burlesque is is um, generally how burlesque that has, that is like 1999 or 1990 or later. This resurgence, this revival, is often called neo burlesque, um, and so this resurgence of burlesque. Um, it started in strip clubs. You know, it started with strippers and uh, women who were participating in sex work, you know, and it was, uh, you know, I can talk about Seattle again and Indigo Blue and Tamara the Trapeze Lady and Paula the Swedish Housewife um, who started the Forgotten Follies and they were all strippers, you know, but they, so here are these women who uh, are generally uh, you know, one, one might say objectified, you know, they're uh, they're performing for uh, patrons, you know, but they have all these talents, right? So Forgotten Follies was a show where um, these strippers who are just dancing on stage naked for the most part get to come out and show their talents. And so Tamara the Trape Trapeze Lady was one of the first people in Seattle, first burlesque performers, um, neo burlesque performers, and uh, you know, she took up uh, the trapeze. She took up aerial art. And uh, so here is someone doing something different, different from what necessarily was um, ascribed to them um, by their role in society, by their uh, professional decisions that they made, and, and, and doing something that they wanted to do, you know? I think it's also, they were a very intelligent, mm -hmm. queer, mm -hmm. um, politically minded women who wanted an avenue to express themselves. Mm -hmm. and. Um, some people associate it with a lot of people who were working in sex work sort of mm -hmm. coming out and trying to find a new way to express themselves. But I think a lot of people who also were drawn to the beginning of burlesque in like 1995 were people who came from a theater background or people who came from a performance art background who were seeing this sort of like glamorous vintage aesthetic and then wanting an opportunity to start to express themselves in the same way. Um, so, well, that's the, you know, we have two large producers, we have a couple performers, you know, mainly performers, and you produce as well. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you feel when, when you get on stage and you're sharing your talent? Like, what's that feeling you get when you're, when you're doing just a, a burlesque act in general? It's like, how does that, it, you know, is it empowering? Is it, is it something, do you ever feel like you're, you don't ever feel like you're being exploited or anything like that, right? There's something very empowering about being on stage. Um, Coming from a theater background, like JoJo said, um, it's 
It's a rush of having an audience communicate with you um, in, in whatever way they're responding to your act. It's very empowering to be up there. It's not exploitative because it's a choice that you're making and you're owning your body and presenting it in a way that you're comfortable with. I mean, if you're not comfortable with it, you shouldn't be on stage. That's how I feel about it. Do you think that it can help help someone become comfortable with their body? They get on stage and, and, and shows and somebody's you know, cheering you want that first time. You're like, yeah, they do want, you know, this is how I look. And, and this that. That's kind of a hard thing because if you're not comfortable or confident with your body and you get up in front of an audience, they're not always going to respond the way that you want them to. Mm -hmm. And if you're not ready for that constructive criticism, it can make you less confident. Uh, so it's got to be an in inherent thing. You can't... The audience can't make you confident, but they can feed the confidence that you already have. Does that make sense? Well, I think burlesque is also an exploration. I think uh, Sydney Devereaux, who's a local, um, well-respected burlesque icon, just wrote a post recently about um, what is sexy? You know, like how do I feel sexy? And she sort of strived the idea that humor is sexy, and it's not the sort of like the traditional view of feminine beauty that makes you sexy. So whatever you believe your strongest asset is, and whatever you want to present to an audience, well, that's sexy, and you have to be confident in that. It's and the I think attitude that, you yeah. bring along with it. Mm -hmm. And to sort of harken back to the idea of, uh, you know, the confidence and feminism and things like that, there's a performer, um, Lydia Ransom, and something she said once really struck me as important. Um, she said that as an, uh, a legally blind woman, as an actress, whenever she would go into an audition, she would always get cast as the villain or some sort of evil character or sort of pushed aside and given like a chorus role and in burlesque she gets to choose who she is she gets to be the ingenue if she so chooses mm -hmm. and I think that that's a really powerful statement about what modern burlesque is mm -hmm. if I want to be the star I am the star if I want to be the disgusting bearded um, Gimli from Lord of the Rings, uh, and I, I sexualize that, I can be that. So I think that's sort of a strong statement about feminism and sexuality in modern burlesque. And I think that's what, at least for me, really empowers me is that I do have control over like every aspect of the act. So, you know, it can be outlandish, but, you know, it's my choice. Like, it's one of those places where, you know, I have total control. It's but, rare, it's, and it's, think about how rare that is actually in any sort of me, uh, entertainment medium where women are the dominant force in storytelling and yes sexuality does play a role and body plays a role and um, there's lots to be said about that but we're in control, we write the stories. If I want to do an act where I get to comment on how the female form is portrayed in video games, then I can actually make a comment on that. By the way, Joystick is July 20th and 20th. By, <laughs> By the way, Pedro Khan is producing, producing an amazing show. burlesque show about gaming. You should buy tickets. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I have my tickets. Yeah, I do too. Uh, I don't because I'm in it. Yeah, I'm hosting so technically. <laughs> So let's talk about Nerdless then. So you know, in this region we call it Nerdless. As you guys said, you do geek less. Yes. It's your series that you do in Portland. Um, we've kind of the professor, um, Professor Jojo, has uh, taken the term Nerdless for our region. In a sense, we've kind of run with it. What you know, where, what's the difference really between Nerdless and the neo burlesque? Is, is there a difference? Is there is there something in Nerdless that makes that different? I think it's a specific passion. Uh, the nerdlesque, you take something that you geek out about, something that you're really nerdy with, and build your act or your show around that. And neo burlesque spans a little bit broader. Um, yeah, I, th I think nerdlesque is sort of like the natural evolution of where modern burlesque is heading. I mean, people have been sort of, I mean, even from Lydia Thompson's age of burlesque, finding inspiration in modern pop culture. So like back then they were doing stage plays based on Robinson Crusoe. And ever since sort of the development of the 
the resurgence, the neo burlesque scene. We've got performers who are taking inspiration from what they see around them, from their obsessions, from their passions. So, like uh, Nasty Canasta in New York has been doing uh, Doctor Who acts for years. Um, so, the idea of getting inspiration from the things we see around us from literature, from film, from television has been happening for quite some time. I just think now the audiences are responding so well to it that performers are seeing that there is actually a need to do a show that's entirely focused on Game of Thrones instead of a simple single Game of Thrones act in one show. I just wanted to add that I think it also makes burlesque very accessible to an audience that may not necessarily um, come to a burlesque show. Um, selling just a regular burlesque show, you know, you definitely get the community in and, you know, they motivate their friends, but if someone hears that there's a Doctor Who show or there's a Joss Whedon show... It's a gateway drug. It, yeah. Exactly, it's a burlesque gateway drug. We, we posted all the comic book shops yes, in nice. Seattle. Um, I would add to that I... Um, I think that it not only provides an experience for the audience, but also performers that may not necessarily find a, a home within the burlesque community. Um, I know, especially in, in Seattle, um, there are so many extraordinary performers, There's, and there are so many um, extraordinary productions that are going on. And um, I know as a producer, I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable going forward with like a, a cast of ca classically trained ballet dancers and don't have the capital to you know to necessarily um, be on uh, on the same level as some of these other productions. But that doesn't necessarily. I mean, with Photos in particular, we strive to maintain uh, artistic vision, to art to maintain uh, a level of production um, that it doesn't have to be one way in order to be amazing. Yeah. You know, and like especially when you know, I, I know with Wayne, Wayne Nesk and with Game of Thrones, it's like there are people that, that feel something in their heart as a result of the you know these topics the fandom. and it shows and it shows well i think fandom yeah. is a really strong thing to tap into and burlesque has scratched the surface mm -hmm. and in the last few years has really just dived in mm -hmm. and i think uh, and a great example was actually you reviewing my show last year um, was this realizing especially you know looking around the audience and reading that review that we we hit something really emotional. Mm -hmm. Fandom is emotional. You love these things. You love these books or these movies or these films. And I appreciate Geek Girl Con because it allows you to not be ashamed of these mm -hmm. things. <laughs> um, but that's what I think these like nerd less really taps into is like it's a pure and unadulterated love of both the art form of burlesque and expressing yourself and a certain fandom. Mm -hmm. So I appreciated reading your words because I could tell that like because you loved Buffy the Vampire Slayer so much when you were growing up <laughs> and it meant something to you emotionally uh -huh. and we weren't just putting ourselves out on stage as the, I call it, the Buffy taking off her pants show. Mm -hmm. There was more emotional content, there was more yeah, just pure love mm -hmm. of the same thing that you love, mm -hmm. which I think audiences respond to and it doesn't need to be this Broadway level production value. Mm -hmm. um, you can get people from all levels, yes, mm -hmm. you can, newbies. I still say, try really hard, work hard, rehearse your mm -hmm. acts, do a good job, get it right for the audience, mm -hmm. but you also don't need to have 20 years of theater background yeah. and ballet training. And the audience, because they love it so much, is right there with yeah. you. And that's yeah. the beautiful thing about live theater is anything could happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So the audience shows up and it could be flawless or Buffy's pants don't actually come off and she has to improv it and that's <laughs> fine. That's a good story. Yeah. Off of the stage. <laughs> I, based on that line then are there, you know, for a performer, are there dangers in the doing in their last act? Or could, because you're dealing with an obsession. You're dealing with, you know, think about dangers. Dangers of, of miss, maybe you are, you go into your act, and if you maybe don't misrepresent something wrong to someone, you have a, you know, this is someone who's very obsessed or very loved, you know, Buffy. So you come out. Let's, you have to do this. You, you have, have to do, you have right. to do you this. You have to yeah. wear this. Are there dangers in, in the act of maybe you're trying to hit the audience right where you love it, but well, you still pass them? I think, um, thankfully, uh, for our Game of Thrones show, the show itself is taken so many liberties with the book 
you know, there's so many things that are happened in the show that are different than what happened in the book. And so we're like writing these acts, and in addition to writing these acts for the geeks and the nerds, we're also trying to write them to stand alone. You know, and so that someone who's never seen it before can also enjoy it. But because the show has taken so many liberties, we're like, eh, yeah, well, you know. Well, it's an <laughs> we, evolution. It's yeah. a different art form. Yeah. It's yeah. A, a different <laughs> way of telling the story. We're taking inspiration from yeah. these works. We're not simply recreating them. It's not cosplay. Um, I, I like the allusion to fan fiction, where people Definitely. are so inspired by these characters and these stories that they want to create something new with them. And I think the best nerdlesque sort of strives to do the same thing, to sort of celebrate why you love it, to take that familiar character and take them somewhere new. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, yeah, it's just as simple as that girl has got that costume so perfect, but I also hope that she's trying to show you something new about that character. Mm -hmm. Some behind the scenes, some internal motivation. <laughs> Along that line, so let's you know, we've all seen all, you know, it's around the country, it's everywhere. What are really the, your favorite nerdless acts? What, what acts have you seen that you're just like, I, that was ridiculous. I can't believe they went that level and just completely went, or you, even maybe you're like, I know that's good, but I have no idea what that was. Well, it's actually, there's, there's three I want to bring up. Um, I've already talked about Sophie's uh, D20 act, which I love. <laughs> hey, you can find it on YouTube. Find it on YouTube. <laughs> I know nothing about Dungeons and Dragons, but I use it as sort of like the poster child for nerdlesque. Um, she also does a Gimli act from uh, Lord of the Rings, and it involves a lot of beards, like Lots a lot of beards. of beards. And I got to see it live, and it was it was fantastic because it takes something um, sort of grotesque and very masculine and makes it funny and sexy. Like it's really sexy. <laughs> um, and uh, me at a table with a group of very of mixed friends, uh, gay, straight, male, female, all loved it the same. Uh, and I think another uh, great example of uh, nerdlesque in this community is a performer in New York, um, Magdalena Fox. She's with Epic Win. And I bring this act up a lot because I think it says a lot of what, what's happening with uh, Nerdless. She did uh, Batgirl act, Barbara Gordon, based on the controversial comic book, The Killing Joke. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what she showed with that act is that burlesque um, is not always safe, um, and it can be dark, and it can be difficult, and it isn't just these silly explorations or of sexuality, like that there is actually a lot of dark material we can explore on stage and still be compelling. Um, I haven't seen the act, so I can't um, really truly judge it for its content because it does sort of deal with some difficult things like sexual assault, um, but I like that someone was willing to go there. Um, and we would say at the end of the act, she becomes Oracle. At the she end becomes of the, the act Oracle. So, from her perspective, she felt like it was a very important journey to show on stage um, a performer who gets harmed um, physically and emotionally being able to sort of uh, take their life back. Um, and I've heard people speak about it very positively and I've had other people be very offended by it and I think that's a really important thing to have in burlesque is art that you can actually discuss. Well yeah. art is supposed to make you feel something yeah. whether it's a positive emotion or a negative emotion it's got to make you feel something to actually be art. And you've seen a lot of burlesque. Uh, have you seen any particular acts that you know, I was think as you're talking, I was thinking about it, and um, you know, there are, I think there are like um, there are certain topics that are deemed nerdy, you know, but you can essentially nerd out on anything. <laughs> yeah. And some of the stuff that I mean, and you started talking about dark burlesque, which I'm so I'm so into dark burlesque things that don't necessarily have happy end happy endings, things that make you feel mm, really uncomfortable inside, um, and I love. The that's asterisk. Uh, uh, Let's rewind that a little that's bit. What they, that's yeah, they cool. have that's F asterisk 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 on the on yeah. the poster. So it's just fill in me. the word there for them. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I love though the they're produced by uh, Heidi von Hott, who is gets uh, we have the privilege of having in our show, um, and Randy Rascal, and um, Heidi von Hott has a John Wayne Gacy uh, number. Uh, and it's a serial killer number, which is something that I have nerded out on big time. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really uncomfortable. Well, I think it's what she's exploring on yeah. stage uh, is controversial in the context of 
perhaps other shows, but in this show, it's sort of about the idea of pushing, mm-hmm. pushing the art form to the next level, yeah. uh, which I think is really important. I also enjoy a lot of the politically minded pieces, the numbers that um, are trying to say something, you know, beyond um, say something about current events or, or you know, the uh, the way that a, a group is existing, unfortunately, um, at, at you know different periods of time, and um, I think that um, they're really fulfilling to watch. You know, and they're and they're not necessarily nerding out about the things that you know they aren't about um, maybe the things that our shows are about, but they're um, taking that fandom or that passion, you know, that drives us to do what we do, um, just in different directions. Yeah. So, well, I think one of the to sort of jump back in. So there's these sort of acts that push boundaries or mm-hmm. are fulfilling in other ways, but I also think that acts like Miss Indigo Blue, who is uh, the 2012 reigning queen of burlesque. One of her first acts that I ever saw her do um, was a Wonder Woman act, mm-hmm. and it was so like just joyous and powerful. But she also, you could tell, she was not showing you just simply like I'm Wonder Woman and I spin around and my tassels twirl and it's amazing. Uh, she had done some research and she was trying to show you a little bit of her origin story, which mm-hmm. I actually didn't know. So here I am watching a burlesque routine and I'm learning about the history of Wonder Woman as an icon in the United States, which is fascinating and brilliant. So, so do you have an actor too that that you really admire for? Um, I really admire um, a lot of the epic win acts over New York. Um, I think one that stands out in my mind and I think gave me permission to go and do my Gimli act was I, I can't recall the performer off the top of my head, but it's the Klingon act. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I cannot remember her name right now either. No, but, it's, but it involves Klingon lady parts, doesn't yes, it? Yes, it does. Oh wow! Yes, yeah. Yeah. and it's <laughs> and much mm-hmm. like a Lord of the Rings dwarf, it's one of those things that you would not associate with being sexy at all, but it it works. Like it's one's well, so, a reference that fans clearly understand. Yes, um, and, and it's, it's. I think it's one that even if you're not a fan of the series, you're like, oh, it's a it's one of those people from that show that had <laughs> on. on. No, it's, it's yeah, definitely, and it, and it pushes what, the idea of sexy right. in a whole new direction that will be uncomfortable for some people mm-hmm. and totally amazing for other people because she did the reference to Klingon lady parts. Um, <laughs> but she also sort of, I believe, embodied the sort of like the attitude of yeah. a Klingon, which is um, <laughs> not sort of the uh, same attitude as a classic fancy burlesque lady. Yeah, and I'm all for kind of taking, you know, the glamour and the beauty and the sexiness of burlesque and kind of twisting She's it. Twisting it, <laughs> turning it yeah. upside down. Which era of Klingon? I believe it was <laughs> Next Generation. Oh, oh okay. yes. So, <laughs> that yeah. That's important to understand. Yeah. As a performer, you have to know, okay, which era of Klingon. And I think that's that points out like what is successful nerdlesque someone who isn't phoning it in and faking it it's not the girl like you know I'm gonna put on a Batgirl outfit and it's gonna be sexy and people will appreciate me it's like no it's like I want to get that exact era right for that fan or I'm gonna um, completely research uh Buffy the Vampire Slayer, so I understand sort of like what the character means culturally. Mm-hmm. So when I get up on stage, uh, I'm doing justice to that character. Um, as a you know, as a kind of wrap up, you know, our final question. And uh, really, what is your dream your last act that you haven't found a home yet for? Maybe you don't know if it'll there's an audience there for it yet. You don't know you haven't done it. Mm-hmm. I will say that I've known Miss Lane yes for years now, and I do want her to do a Thursday next. Act at some point. Uh, Thursday next is a is a book series um, by Jasper Ford. He's a Welsh writer about a, about a woman who is a detective in a book universe. And, and actually, she can goes jump between, from, she book, can go to from book, book to book. It's so <laughs> good throughout this whole. And it's a wonderful playing upon literary styles and especially British literature. I would love to see how that translates to the stage. Yeah. I'll work on it. Yeah, it, it, it would it would work. I mean, Get me a things, venue and yeah, I'll work. Like out. like one of the things they do in the series is they communicate to you through um, uh, notes at the bottom of the page. And it's the Cheshire Cat that's talking to you, so it's all in that cadence. So, but um, is there one that you have that you... Is there really something that I have? Um, God, not off the top of my head. The Samus was a really big one for me. Who is it again? Samus. Samus Aran. Samus Aran. Uh, which you can see at Joystick, July 20th and 21st. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a really big one, and I think... Uh, a lot of the reason that we're pulling together the show is so that I can get my nerd on in that way. 
Yeah. Um, now, is there something that you want really want to see either you could do yourself or something you really want someone um, to do? I want to do a horror movie show really bad. Um, I am also excited for The X Files. <gasps> You stole my answer. <laughs> oh, sorry. I started really, thinking about something else. Oh, okay. yeah, I'll, I'll describe it more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, so I yours. really love um, horror and gore. You know, and uh, there's an audience for that. There, there is, is an, audience. an audience. It's yeah. the. It's. I think the difficulty would be finding performers who can accurately uh, translate that from. And I guess it's like my own producer perfectionism. I'm like, this is what's great about this movie, you know. Well, I think that's sort of like <laughs> that is exactly what we're all doing. Yeah. Like, this is why I love it so yeah. much. This and is this is what I want to show of, you. Yeah. On I, stage. Yeah. Cla- classic horror, big time. Nice. <laughs> so you want a Nosferatu number on stage? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. I saw an amazing Nosferatu number in New York. It's like total like Nosferatu go go. <laughs> it is so disturbing <laughs> and wonderful. Oh, Find the YouTube fantastic. video. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sophie, what you do a horror show? You've I'll obviously chilled. <laughs> some of your dream acts. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, so many of our fantasies. Thank you. Yay! Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. No, I think Gimli was like. I, I'm not sure I can do much better than Gimli, but. Um, ever since we did, and this is interesting being around the joystick people, ever since we did our video game show last year, I've kind of wanted to do a Space Invaders act. I'm still, I think it's going to happen. I'm still trying to figure out the logistics. Is that a group number kind of thing? Yeah, and it's going to involve a lot of things flying in the air, like a lot. (laughs) Marshmallows probably, but yeah. So I'm just, yeah, I'm hoping that'll like materialize in the next couple months. I hope so too. It's going to be the next one, probably. Well, as uh, Matt, Sorry. I, I've had my sights on producing the Burlex Files <laughs> yeah. um, for uh. some time now. <laughs> and I've got some ideas, and I've got a lot of performers who are interested. I think that, that um, it won't be a long-running show. It'll be like a weekend show. But I think there's enough um, love for the X-Files here in Seattle that it would do quite well. Uh, my personal act, even though I'm not performing right now, is one day I would love to do a Captain Mal Reynolds from Firefly. I really identify with the character, and I like the idea that he, um, I feel, is very put upon in his role as being sort of the captain of the ship and the leader and sort of the person in charge, but he's really just a goofball underneath. Um, and so I would just love to do sort of a traditional, like, just bump and grind fest um, <laughs> and sort of show an audience the sort of like fun side of Captain Mal Reynolds and I also think that the sort of the brown coat costume is ripe for burlesquing I mean breeches and suspenders are really really sexy <laughs> yes I mean we did the behind the blue door was just recently happened in the yeah, Doctor Who there, yes and there's Captain Jack Harkness uh, down my phone named Fosse Jack we did things to a severed hand that probably <laughs> can't unsee but uh, uh, he, you know, and he used that to, to you know, he's using these suspenders. I mean, they're right there for you. Um, I mean, I'll close it personally. For me, I, I haven't got on stage and taken my clothes off yet, but I'm, I'm getting to that point. I, I host mainly, but I, I really want to do the Journey of Dream from the Sandman series. Um, and I want, game it. Yeah, I want to do mm-hmm. three, three person act with someone playing Delirium, someone playing Death, and doing the Journey of Dream and actually start out in full black as Dream. And no Lita Hall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But we'll have we do the journey. Have Delirium show up, go on our little journey. And Delirium takes off her clothes, and then Death shows up to close that out. And I die on stage and switch back into the white into Daniel. So well, would. I think that just to hear all these ideas, I think that's the sort of strength of what's happening in Nerdless because these ideas that are in us um, a few years ago. Um, maybe didn't fit on the burlesque stage and now it's almost as if we're being given permission um, by our audiences to bring these um, sort of cuckoo bananas <laughs> ideas because there are people who do appreciate them and they do want to see them and they do want to celebrate them with us so you know ten years ago maybe it wouldn't have worked but now the culture has changed enough and audience has evolved enough where they really do want to see right. a Neil Gaiman burlesque mm-hmm. it's right for Taking off your clothes. Uh, I always wrap up and say thank you guys. Thank you so much for, for doing this with us. Um, this came on Stark Naked, July 13th and 14th here at the Theater off Jackson. It'll be downstairs in the actual yep. theater part. Um, July 20th and 21st, we have Joystick, Geek Girl Con fundraiser. Uh, so come out, support Geek Girl Con, get ready for Geek Girl Con, which is coming up in August. We have We Nest Burlesque in August. 
which is going to be crazy. I've seen some of the acts that you have in mind, and it, it's going to be great. And you guys are still going strong down yes. in Portland. What's uh, your next? Uh, we do Geek Lask reruns, which are our favorite acts, um, every other month. And then um, the next one we have coming up, the next original Geek Lask we have coming up is in late September in conjunction with the Retro Gaming Expo. There you go. And how do we find you? Do you have a website? Do you have a Facebook? We have a Facebook. Yes. <laughs> Or anyone else you can look them up by name. So yes. thank you so much. And this thank is Thank you. Bye.